Um, hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Nancy Coffey. For those of you who don't know me, I've been working on Beverly Farms history for Ever. about 12 years, maybe. <laughs> and I, I, right now, I'm finally working on writing the book that I said I was going to write about, really about the ordinary people of Beverly Farms. So Joe Garland's already done a great job on the summer folks and I touch on them but I'm not really writing about them. I'm writing about ordinary people. And I've just been writing the part about division and I thought, oh, I'll do the division lecture again. I did it 10 years ago. Well, I thought, and so I thought, I'll just use the old talk and well, the old talk in the slides <laughs> didn't work. So, so this is essentially a new talk. Um, how many of you had heard about division, Beverly Farms' attempt to divide from Beverly before? Pretty much everybody, okay. Um, what you may not know is that the first time Beverly Farms decided to separate was in 1717. Um, and this is from the Manchester town clerk wrote that the town meeting voted to choose a man to send to the general court, court should have been capitalized, with the men from the farm of Captain West in Beverly, with a petition to get them off from Beverly to us in Manchester. Um, Ed Brown, who, as you all know, passed, died this last summer, has always believed that it was because Beverly Farms was so isolated from Beverly, that it was hard for people to get to Beverly to church, the road to Manchester was a lot easier. Um, and we have a couple of descriptions of what the road was, what the road was like. Um, the first is from a lecture by Robert Rantoul. He gave a Lyceum lecture in 1831. And this is the way he described the road. The road from the first parish meeting house to Manchester, now Hale Street, is about six miles in an easterly direction. It's a hard road, meaning it was gravel. But being in many parts too narrow, it's frequently blocked with snow. It's crooked and hilly and has several steep ascents. Most of the people employed in the fisheries live along the road. It lies near the margin of the sea and its whole ex in its whole extent, and land near it is generally rough and abounds with stone. Though intermixed with first tillage, first rate tillage land, yielding an average crop of 40 bushels of Indian corn to the acre. As it approaches Manchester, it has some good farms. There are three public schools on, houses on the road, one of them being in the Cove, and the Christian Meeting House. The Meeting House is in a settlement, the settlement called, called the Farms, about four miles easterly of First Parish Meeting House, and contains about 300 inhabitants. So that's in 1831. By 1850, or before, by the 1840s, Beverly Farms was a depressed area. Um, fishing had, the War of 1812 had killed a lot of um, um, commercial um, sea trade. Fishing fell off somewhat. Um, when they were no longer shipping to Spain because somebody else was shipping there then or to the Indies. Um, and most, mo more people, the farms, in the, the farms in the farms weren't all that productive. And so a lot of farmers were, um, listed themselves as shoemakers rather than farmers. A lot of people in the farms had 10 footers in their backyards. The men were, um, Cutting the, cutting the shoes and the women were sewing them at night at home um, before the fire. Lucy Mar Larkham did that as a young woman. What's a ten footer? Ten footer, the art. Um, <laughs> Jerry, Par uh, Jerry DeFazio's um, tiny part of the shop, oh, yeah. that was a ten footer. Ten feet wide. Um, they were ten feet, I don't know if they're ten feet by ten feet, but they were small shoe shops. Yeah that people had in their yards. And there's still several in Beverly in different places. Um, Robert Rantoul was on the school committee and lots of other things and came to Beverly a lot. Um, a much more romantic description of the road um, describes the road that 
came to appeal to the summer people. This is from Lucy Larkham from her autobiography, um, A New England Girlhood. Sometimes my brother John would get permission to take me to visit the old homestead at the farms. She lived, um, I think, on Wallace, near where the Larkham Theater is now, is, was her home. Three or four mi miles was not thought too long a walk for a healthy child of five years old. And that road, in the old time, led through a rural paradise, beautiful in every season whether it were the time of song sparrows and violets, of wild roses, of coral-hung barberry bushes, or of falling leaves and snowdrifts. The wildness of the road was its great charm to us. We stopped at the Cove Brook to hear the catbirds sing, and at Mingo's Beach in revel, to, um, to revel in the su sudden surprise of the open sea, and to listen to the chant of the waves, always stronger and grander there than anywhere along the shore. We passed under dark wooded cliffs out into sunny openings, the last of which led under its skirting pines to the secret of the prettiest wood path to us in all the world, the path to our ancestral home. This is um, a house that still exists, um, much changed now. So the farms was beautiful, secluded, and poor in the 1840s. Then in, 1840, in 1847, the railroad actually came through the farms. The Eastern Railroad had decided in 1845 to run the track through, through here. And this is a map that was made in 1852, the Walling map. And you can see the railroad tracks right here. Um, this is Hart Street out here. And this is Hale, Hart into Hale. Here is the Baptist Church right here. High Street had been built by 1854. You notice there's no Haskell Street. This is Hale Street coming in. And this, by the way, these things are holes in the map. So that's not anything, that's a hole. <laughs> um, and by this time, by the time the railroad was built, a few of the people who were on the inside had started buying land along the property, along the coast. Henry Lee was one of them. And his house was built in 1845. And that house is still standing, much changed, um, in another time, I'll show you the changes. But the early houses that were built were very simple country houses. With one exception, they were not fancy. Um, this is the Franklin Haven estate, which was on the beach. Um, and I don't know which is the oldest part, maybe this one. This is the West Farms. West Farms was being sort of Pride's, beyond Pride, Pride's Crossing going toward Beverly was the West Farms. And here in the West Farms is, Smith's, is Plum Cove, where the Lorings lived. And one of the earliest houses there was Caleb William Loring's house, which still stands and is lived in by Peter and Babette Loring. Um, but again, it was a, a simple house. Then in the 1860s and 1870s, with the, with the railroad here, things began to change. More and more summer estates were built, are built during this period. Payne Avenue, the, in, inside, um, the inland side of Hale Street along the water, and Valley and Juniper Streets begin to be developed. And so there's a much larger summer community. There's just still pretty much all people from Boston or Salem. <coughs> They're all Massachusetts people. Uh, only one house, for, um, Franklin Dexter's, which is still stands near, in, near Endicott on the water, was built almost as a, man, as a mansion. None of the rest were. Um, the old engine house during this period, which had been down by Dix Park and was very small, was moved and then enlarged at West and Hale Streets. And you'll see a picture of that in a minute. Um, in 1871, 
Beverly got piped water from Wenham Lake. And the farms got piped water early. So it wasn't the last district in town to get it. Um, also by this time, a few Irish immigrants and their families had settled in Beverly Farms. Um, Haskell Street is laid out in this period and a consolidated school is built there. And Farms Church records show that there's little employment for young native-born residents, that many of them are beginning to move away because they, there's, there are no jobs for them. Um, this isn't, uh, the, t the t um, farms named their fire station Perseverance because it took them so long to get it. Um, this is actually the North Beverly one, but it's exactly the same pattern as Perseverance was. It was quite an elegant building, and it stood at the corner of Hale and West Streets. And you'll see a picture of it later. Um, this is an early, early photograph of the farm's church. And the building next to it was the, um, the East Farm School. Um, the brook that runs under Dix Park was the marking between the West Farms and the East Farms. So Pride's Crossing was part of the West Farms. Anybody who, anybody who lived on the other side of that brook, the children went to the West Farm School, which was in Pride's Crossing. Um, this building still stands. It's, um, oh, I, if I stop for all this, I'm not going to get through the talk, so I better not. <laughs> this is the consolidated school that was built in, 18, in seven, 1872. Um, on the opposite corner of what's now Webster Avenue than the, the current or the, the brick school that's still there. Where the yellow house is? Yes, where the yellow house is. Um, and this lived for a long time at several different iterations. 1879, the Pride um, Station was built. And I don't think that covering came until much later. The original station was just this simple building. And that's when it becomes known as Pride's Crossing. Peter Pride lived there. That's where the name came from. Um, this is a view of the farms in the 1880s. And we're still trying to figure out just where it was taken from. Um, and it was as part of the division propaganda. They, used, they took this picture. Um, you can see the farm's church here. Um, I think this is. Hedge Powers House, the John Larkham House, and over here I think is maybe the old Haskell House that still stands there. The ocean's out here, you can see it. We think maybe the photographer was standing on the um, hill that's being developed off Greenwood Avenue and Webster Avenue. I, did a little Facebook quiz, and that's what people came up with. Um, this is the farms in 1880, and it's what you can see is that there's a big, still a big development out here. This was known as Up Country, out on Hart Street, um, and there's now a, quite a few houses along here, but it's not thickly settled, any of the area along here, and most of these these places in here now and in here are summer estates. So what had been farmland is by the 1870s and 80s estate land. Um, and this is West Street, and you can see it's still got farms on it in 1880. So this is the engine house. This is a blacksmith shop yeah. and a small store. Andrew Stanley had um, I don't know if this is his 10-footer behind. He later had a little bit of a shop. Um, uh, he had something larger, I think, as a shoe company. This was another blacksmith shop on, and this is Vine Court, which didn't go very far. And the post office, which had previously been out here, was now by the railroad tracks. This is the farm station as it was expanded in the 1880s. So um, there were additional built. Yeah. I'm not sure if all of that was in the 80s. Maybe some of it might have been a little later. Um, 
I don't know why I'm showing you that again. So. Oh, um, this was what this is Hart. This is High Street. And does anybody recognize this house? It's still there. This is. Um, no, um, this is Eleanor, Law Eleanor and David Lawler's house, and that was built by Ezra Williams, and then later lived in by his daughter Cassie and her husband. So this was one of the first streets, the first houses built on this side of High Street, and all of this was still an orchard that was part of the John Larkham farm. This was all part of John Larkham's farm, and that picture was taken after, I'm not sure if these are telephone wires or um, electric light wires, probably telephone. Is that the red house, Nancy? Is no, it's a white, white house. It is still white. It's on the other it's side of the street. The street from the red house. Yeah. Um, so here you can see Pride's Crossing, and I'm showing it to you in part because a man who lived here, John T. Morse, becomes very important in the um, division struggle. And here's more. You can see here that these are summer estates now. Martin Brimmer was also involved. This is the Charlie, Charles Greeley Loring House, which was recently torn down, but was the first shingle house on the North Shore and was built in 1881. So this is the early 1880s, a lot's going on. But Beverly Farm still had a, lore, a lovely rural landscape. And this is what the summer people who came wanted. This is, um, oh, what, what, why can't I say the name of the street? Beach Street. Um, Lover's Lane. Lover's yeah, Lover's Lane, Lane but it's Beach Street. Uh, <coughs> this, this was what the summer people wanted. They wanted a place where they could drive their carriages out in the woods, where they were among wildflowers, um, they didn't want any of the city. They were escaping from the city. So this was paradise. Note on the bottom says, doesn't it remind you of the good old summertime? Yeah. <laughs> um, the farms had a population of, at the, at, in the 80s, and I'm not sure what year this is. Um, so it's still, so there were already 60 summer residents out of the 277, so that's a lot. The old farm's names, they were farmers, shoe, shoemakers, carpenters, builders, painters, craftsmen of all kinds. And as the summer people came in, more and more their businesses were catering to those summer people. Um, these were the Irish families that were here by the 1880s. The Conleys are still around, the Bradys are still around, the Linehans are still around, the Leahys are still around, some of the McKegs. Um, not sure of any of the others. Uh, the family men were working as contractors, masons, gardeners, grooms, coachmen. These are the people who formed the, formed the nucleus of the families that founded St. Margaret's Church. And in addition, more and more Irish laborers were coming in, single men. Okay, compare this to Beverly. Now, here we've got this lovely, idyllic community. And this is downtown Beverly in 1882. Here's the waterfront. Over here on the Bass River, these are all factories. There's a lot of factory down here. If you, and population, almost 10,000. And without it's no, I'm compared a little bit so you yeah. saw what the farms was. Um, so the farms had a lot of acres. Um, and the 1880 atlas covers downtown Beverly and Beverly Farms, but it doesn't cover any other part of Beverly. Yes, Doug. The farms. There were 200 houses. Third line down voters. 200 houses and 203 voters, all of them men. Where does it say 200 houses? Oh. 
in, in the, oh, in the, in the 1880s, thought. women didn't have the right to vote. No, I. Two hundred. Okay. Okay. I don't know. Voters. Okay. I can't answer you that. We'll come back to it later, though. Okay. It was a previous slide. Some people voted okay. twice. Some people voted twice. Yeah. <laughs> they were voting the cemetery. Okay. Um, but it's interesting, Browside, North Beverly, and Centerville were, both, were all very rural at this oh. time. And there were no centers of town in those places. Right. Only North Beverly had its own church. So here's some of the factory district in, Be in Beverly. This is River Street and Park Street, around the railroad tracks, as you can see. Um, carriage factories, lots of shoe factories. These are all shoe factories. Um, more shoe factories, and this, and this is the Beverly Pottery over here, yeah. which is a big company. Um, I think we've got, uh, oh, the tannery. This is a tannery here and a tannery over here. These were closer to the river. So Ellis Square in the 1880s has a street railway, force drawn. Uh, so it's, Beverly's built up and growing. Trees are quite young in that. <laughs> yeah. Um, in 1880, the telephone comes to the North Shore for the first time. And it comes first to, sorry, I need to go back. Uh, it comes first to Salem. This is not Beverly or Salem in the picture below. It's just showing the early telephone wires. Look at the right. telephone yeah, that may have had more than that. It's, it's not local. The first clash came between the summer people and their attitude toward Beverly Farms and Beverly over the telephone. Um, <clears throat> the Salem Company wanted to extend their lines to Gloucester and run them through Beverly and Beverly Farms. And they put them, they put them in, and some of the posts were along the land of wealthy landowners. <coughs> Yes, it says, it happened they were in many cases placed before the estates of some of the people who have seaside residents along the road through that part of the village. Well, they demanded a hearing. They went before. Um, they said it was the spoiling their views. Um, they didn't want, they reminded them too much of what they had left behind. And they paid a large amount of taxes in Beverly, and they shouldn't be there. <laughs> and believe it or not, the city council, the town fathers, folded. No. Um, the telephone poles were removed. The line, to, and, oh, and the the Salem, the Salem company said at first, if we take these out, we're not going to have any phones in Beverly. We're not going to run our lines through Beverly at all. They finally. Relent. Relented on that and found a route through Wenham. Beverly Farms did not get telephones until the 1890s. <laughs> and it's no, in no internet. No, no internet. But it's interesting. This um, Susie Lamott found this little book, which was a North Shore, um, a guide to the North Shore. And it has a I think it's, is it in this section that I have? The, um, the guide describes all the beautiful houses on the North Shore. And then in the last section on Beverly Farms, it says, Beverly Farms needs to have telephones. I, we don't understand why the city fathers refuse to allow them here. <laughs> so the power of money. So, sorry, I'm going, moving on the wrong one. Um, the other thing that the, the city, that the summer people really liked to do, as I said, was to go out on carriage rides. And when the railroad came through Beverly Farms, it took, okay, the railroad took a section of Hale Street to, in order to have a straight road. If you've ever ridden on the train and seen the three houses that faced the tracks, they were on Hale Street. And when the train came through, they lost their frontage and were now on the tracks. And they had to 
move Hale Street up climbing the hill and then coming down. This is St. Margaret's Church before it was built, it was right up here. This is Miller's Hill. And so probably with a little pressure from the summer people, um, the town straightened the road. And the people who did the straightening were the young company of Conley brothers. And this was their first job. And they did it well <laughs> and went on to flourish. Um, in April, in April of 1885, so we've gone a few years beyond the telephone problem, um, the town decides they're going to run the, the railway, the horse railway, to Boyle's Corner. Oh, it's a horse railway. It's a horse railway. Oh, it's on tracks, but it's a horse railway. And so they're going to run that to the corner um, where you turn to go down to Beverly after, you know, after the brook. Now, this isn't the Eastern Railroad. No, no, this is just the street railway, oh, okay. the horse-drawn street railway. Well, they weren't coming to the farms, but they were coming close. <laughs> <laughs> invasion. Yeah, invasion. So two summer residents, T.K. Lothrop, who lived... Um, Oh, where is this house? Oh, sorry. Here's his house. He lived out here. Oh, I'm not talking nearly fast enough. Um, anyway, they decided Beverly Farms was going to be destroyed by the street railway. And you let them, you know, get them that close, they'll be down here in a minute. And we don't want it. So. Lothrop and Morse tried to start a, a movement for secession then, and nobody was interested much. But then in 18, and so they paid no attention. In 1885, Marshall's store and hall was built at the corner of Hale and West Streets. Now this is fantastic because this is the biggest building in the farms. It's got a third floor that has an assembly hall. And this becomes and I love this. He deals in drugs, medicines, and chemicals, and also has a full line of gents furnishings. So it's the only men's, men's store and pharmacy around. It was a hit. Everybody loved it. The grand opening had a ball, um, dancing by Dunbar's Irish band. Um, Captain Lamazny led the dancing on the floor. Um, and Obviously, it was the perfect place to have events. I'm not going back. Oh, I'm going backwards. So in November, that opened in June, I think, Morse and Lothrop send out invitations to everybody in town that there'll be a mass meeting on the subject of why Beverly Farms should separate from Beverly. And it was being held at Marshall's Hall. Everybody came. The hall was filled. Everybody's sitting everywhere. They fill up all the seats. They're sitting on railings. Women are there, um, and they argue. West Beach is a large industrial, but West Beverly, in other words, Maine Be Beverly, is a large industrial town, almost a city. Beverly Farms is a simple country town. Um, town meetings are too far to attend. 4.6 miles is a little stretching it. Um, they can't get there. Beverly Farms residents are disenfranchised and neglected. They don't have re much representation. The high school's too far away. The taxes would be lowered if we separated from Beverly. Um, and they proposed the borders. So this is the new, the new borders. Wow. Here's the border for Beverly Farms, which runs right along the creek. Can we stop marching tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> um, is the border where the extent of where the horse-drawn railway made its way? The, um, it was the horse-drawn railway, which hadn't even happened yet, um, would have come to here, I think. I, I can see factory workers getting on the horse-drawn railway and getting off and picking corn the farmers are getting back. Uh, there weren't many farmers left okay. in the farms at this point. Okay. Um, so 
Addison Davis asked questions. Addison Davis was an ice dealer, um, and he worked um, up on the Onion River. He lived on Pla Preston Place and cut ice and sold it in Beverly Farms. Um, this is according to the Beverly Times. Addison Davis wasn't convinced that Beverly Farms would be better off if it were set off from Beverly. He saw no reasons why voters couldn't get to a town meeting once a year. He wanted to know what provision had been made for getting water if the farms was set off. He wanted to be convinced that separation made sense. So he was there to listen. The second man who was, well, was much stronger in his opinions, and this was William Leahy, um, Ed Leahy's grandfather, Anne Marie Pope's grandfather. William Leahy was a blacksmith, and I love special pains taken with interfering and overreaching horses. Um, he, had been, he had been a blacksmith in Boston. He was, um, worked for somebody else. People who had summer houses out here found him a good blacksmith, convinced him to come out here. By 1880, he had bought property, built a house for himself, and by 1881, he had, or I can't remember if it's 81 or 82, he had built the big yellow house that you live in, the, the brewing house, uh, which was at that time a rooming house for the Irish laborers who were coming in. He was a smart cookie. He wasn't some flabinate. William Leahy moved that this part of town not be separated from Beverly. Beverly had done very well by us, and we ought not to grumble. Mr. Leahy then went on to state that Beverly had, what, what Beverly had done, but his talk and manner seemed so objectionable to the audience that his re remarks were ruled out of order. He jumped up quite frequently, however, and was several times called to order and hissed. John T. Morse off, then offered the following motion, the sense of the meeting being in favor of setting off this part of town from Beverly, and it's being incorporated into a town of itself. Leahy said that when Nahant was set off, taxes were $10 on 1,000. Now they were 25. He said the legislature would keep the old town together. More hisses. Mr. D Leahy was called to order by Mr. Dalton and was required to take his seat. Um, so they went right along. The petitioners, um, Testimony before the House of Representatives was in March of 1886. John Larkham, um, John Watson, who was one of the Irishmen, Daniel Hardy, Wyatt, Hobbs, and Eaton went. All of these, not summer, most, the, some of the summer people were taxed in all ways in Beverly. There were two kinds of taxes. Everybody paid real estate tax but only ones who declared Beverly their primary residence also paid um, what was called property tax, but that was property that could include your stock, everything else. And one of the reasons the, division, the wealthy divisionists wanted this change was to protect their assets, get their own town. Um, so notice they only send the locals to speak for them. Um, and they got all the usual arguments. <clears throat> the testimony against division, their primary testifier, was John I. Baker. He'd been 19 years a state legislator. He was the chief selectman in Beverly. He was known as the King of Beverly. And he loved Beverly. He believed and was very generous throughout his life to Beverly and to good causes. He argued that Beverly Farms was not neglected. It had benefit from Beverly's development of roads and piped water. The primary impetus for division came from wealthy summer residents who were looking for a tax dodge. The division petition went forward and was voted down, oh my God. 131 to 78. Oh, no. Baker, is that Baker of Baker's Island? No, but it's Bessie Baker Park in Beverly is named for his daughter. Then um, right after this, there was a new assault. Um, Beverly reassessed all of its pro properties. And whether it's true or not exactly, Beverly Farms felt they were, cheap. They were being overassessed. And 
like the mutton chops. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the division com committee set to work again. Daniel Nar Hardy's the new chair. Committee members went door to door to, with a new petition. 282 adult males signed. 90 of those were Irish. And they, these were their occupations. And this is everybody's occupations, not just the Irish. So, ledge men were they, they were quarrying ledge out in the woods here. Um, so these were the petitioners. There was also uh, with the women, even though they couldn't vote, also signed. 198 women signed the petition. 44 of them were Irish. Um, John I. Baker is thinking. They're not going to stop. Maybe we can satisfy them without division. So they held a special town meeting in 1886, promising to locate a new fire engine and build a new fire with all the things that bells set and all the bells and whistles, and build a new fire and a new engine house. Add nine fire, new fire hydrants in the farms. Widen Hart Street. Build a sidewalk its entire length. Rebuilt the cover, culvert near the Manchester line. Enlarged the sawmill culvert wow. under Hale Street. And that's right by Dick's Park. That's yeah. where the sawmill was. Mm -hmm. Install kerosene street lights without reflectors on several additional streets and remove reflectors on the existing ones. I don't know why that was. Convert the current firehouse into a branch library. Wow. Okay. Um, all of the rich Beverly Farms landowners said, we oppose the pur purpose, purchase of new fire apparatus and building a new firehouse. It's extravagant. Are you kidding? <laughs> no. Um, FEMA will save your August, uh, Augustus Loring wrote to the paper and said, everybody doesn't believe this. They've signed this because they think it's going to raise their tax bill this year. Um, everything was accepted at the town meeting with the exception of the new culvert at Manchester. I'm sorry. I'll go back. Yeah. And the library of Pastries argued that a branch library in the farms would lead to requests from all the other outlying districts. So that was not passed. Oh. But the farms is granted a regular special delivery of books instead. They had a bookmobile. And here's the, the new fire station with all of the new equipment. And that's the old GAR hall right next to it. The library compromise provides bi-weekly book delivery, coming to A.M. Liffin's store, and his daughter Lizzie Liff Liffin would be taking care of the collection. It was too little too late. Divisionists were de more determined than ever. Um, <laughs> the public face of the divisionists is a committee of local people chaired by Daniel Hardy. And members of that committee traveled throughout the state and met with every state wow. legislator, senators and representatives. They held fundraisers for division. Here's a fair and supper at Marshall's Hall done by the Ladies Committee, a series of lectures on the Civil War, all proceeds going to division. Behind the scenes, a group of wealthy Boston-based divisionists collected large sums of money. Funds were used to hire a lawyer, Frederick Williams, to start a newspaper, sorry, there should have been a comma, they called the Beverly at Farms Advocate, hire all available lobbyists and in other ways that weren't reported. Wow. So this is, I, wow. thanks to um, Joan Johnson's grandfather, a copy of, or great-grandfather, a copy of The Advocate was bound, and Joan has given that to Historic Beverly, so all of you can go and look at it. Um, it ran for about a year, and here it is, um, and it was mostly devoted to all the reasons why Beverly Farms should, should separate from Beverly. And, but it also had a lot of good local news, published um, jokes, stories, I'm, I'm going to answer questions at the end, political cartoons. Um, here is... Can you guess who this is supposed to be? Two that do not believe in division. 
two hearts that beat as one. So this is a, a spoof on William Leahy with his Irish dress and his alcoholic nose. Um, they accused him of being an alcoholic. I have no idea if he was. Wow. He certainly was a shrewd businessman and a donkey. And this, can you recognize who this is? Baker. This is John I. Baker, yeah. Um, and these are the library books. They're saying, not enough for us. Um, Lucy Larcom, who lived in Beverly but had strong ties through her family to Beverly Farms, um, pushed against it. I couldn't find a copy of her original letter, but, which was in the Beverly Times, I think. But she was thoroughly castigated in the, in the advocate. Everybody was against Lucy, who had a summer house in Bever apartment in Beverly Farms. In 1887, the division committee brought every member of the house, the committee on towns, to visit Beverly Farms. They're given a tour of the community and treated to a banquet at Marshall's Hall. In, oh, I love this part. Um, this is an agreement published in um, the Beverly the Advocate. Um, I, Frank McDonald, do hereby promise if the town is divided to wheel SF Cahoon in a wheelbarrow from the engine house to Preston Place and back again, at 1 o'clock p.m. on the fast day, preceded by George W. Tucker with a dress, with a drum. The wheel man is to be dressed in women's clothes. Oh <laughs> and then they sign it, and then down below, somebody else is promising the same thing. So everybody was, spirits were high, everybody was making jokes, and they were sure they were going to be successful, and they were. <coughs> Hearings were held before the Committee on Towns, Testimony for the petitioners reached 300 printed pages. Wow. Um, the Beverly testimony was 215 printed pages. The committee reports in favor of the petitioners. And the general court votes for, decision, for division. Um, and this was published in the paper, the honor roll. 23 yeas in the Senate, that being a majority of eight and 137 yeas in the House, majority of 44. So Beverly Farms was thrilled. Um, this is great. It has the Beverly man and the Beverly Farms man. This was a cartoon in the paper. And they're arguing, and the Beverly Farms man says, hello, how'd you like it? Um, this is right after the vote. And the Beverly man says, like what? Why the vote? Know nothing about it. Ain't heard, I suppose. Ha, ha, ha. Boodle. Boodle? How much do you want? Well, you pay us what it costs you and we'll let you get off. Let us off? Gad, that's good. We got off without your help. Beverly man, perhaps not. The governor will take care of us. Beverly Farms, ha, ha, the governor. I guess he will. He'll take care of you, he will. Ha, ha, ha. Come on down and see us. Ha, ha. <laughs> and this was published, too. This is the proposed new um, train station for the new town of Beverly Farms. <laughs> <laughs> However, all too good to be true. Uh, Senator Slattery of Flaming, Framingham claims the, the committee had tried paying people off. Legislative investigation discovers that a committee of John T. Morris, Martin Brimmer, et cetera, um, had raised $18,000 from summer residents to persuade legislators to vote for division. And that was 477549 in today's money. So it was big bucks. Um, this put the governor in a terrible position. Um, Oliver Ames, who who's had relatives living here in the farms as summer residents and was friends with most of them, was the Republican governor. Um, if he okayed this, he was putting his own party in jeopardy. The party said, you know, we can't be tainted by this corruption. And so in the end, he vetoed. Mm. Well, yeah.
Yeah, yeah. Beheaded by one of the names of shovels, yeah. No, the farm residents vowed to continue to fight. Farms children were taken out of Beverly schools, the Beverly Grammar School. Farms women planned to boycott Beverly stores. The advocate kept going on for a while and then gradually it folded. Um, John T. Morse and Lothrop both moved out of the farms. Um, the locals made one last try and failed again. Um, Beverly adjusted the tax rate and summer residents lost interest. The taint of corruption scared them off. By 1890, the campaign for division was over. This is a, um, Joan, did I tell you I found it? Yeah. Um, this is something else from Joan, which was a little paperback book that the um, divisionists produced for this third attempt, um, showing pictures of uh, comparing estates in Beverly and Beverly Cove and Beverly Farms and what they were assessed for. The picture, the overview picture of Beverly Farms was in that. So was the picture of the Beverly Farms School. So it's a good resource, but it didn't do them any good. Um, Beverly became a town in a, a city in 1894, and that meant there could be no division. Cities couldn't be divided. Um, but Beverly Farms, all of this working together of summer people and ordinary people, and pulling the Irish immigrants in with them, really built a lot of cohesion in Beverly Farms. And it was, the late 1880s were a very prosperous and good time. Um, the residential building boom continued. St. Margaret's Church was built. The Beverly Boot and Shoe Company began. Didn't last long, but it started. The O'Brien brothers built a block. Organizations grew and flourished. Here you can see um, the old firehouse next to the new firehouse. And that was given to the Grand Army of the Republic, Preston Post, which was founded probably when they thought Beverly Farms was going to be a separate town, they founded their own post. Um, and later, the library moved in, the neighbor's library, well, I think I maybe said say this later. Um, St. Margaret's Church is built in 1887, um, and it's a glorious building, and was built by the Irish with help from the summer community. Now, where the parking lot is, that house was the cross house. No relation to the current crosses. Um, everybody recognize this building? The Tunapu. That's the Tunapu. It was built in 1888 as the Beverly Farms Boot and Shoe Company. Um, it didn't last. By 1890, it was serving as a um, carriage when this picture was taken. It was serving as a um, I don't know if they were making carriages or repairing carriages. It eventually became a rooming house and then the hotel. That's my great grandfather. I was going to ask you. Yeah. Okay. And here's Augustus P. Loring, who was one of the um, founders of the shoe company, shoe cup companies. And I also found out that he was, as I was searching deeds in Beverly Farms, he was a, a very often the mortgage holder on all of the houses that Irish people were building. The O'Briens, who did not live in Beverly, but did a lot of building here, the O'Brien brothers of Boston, maybe they lived here part time, I don't know, but they built the O'Brien block, which is right next door to the Leahy block, which is over here. Um, and this was the first commercial and uh, um, housing block in the farms. Um, social events were all over the place. Everybody had a good time. Um, Where's Walnut Grove? Walnut Grove is up on, the, uh, on West Beach Hill and beyond toward, and I'm not, it was where the Dalton, it was part of the Dalton property. Mm -hmm. And that they all thank the Daltons. But that was a favorite picnic ground for mm -hmm. church picnics. Uh -huh. um, the GAR held one there. Um, 1888, July, had the first horribles oh, parade. Oh my God. Um, 
Horrible Parades existed. Um, I'll just read you the little news clipping. The 4th of July was recognized in measure by the people of the farms as a day to set apart for fireworks and frolic. The rising generation rose up in all their strength and paved the streets with exploded firecrackers and made the air heavy laden with the musical strains of the tin horn. The chimes in the Baptist church chimed from about 3 a.m. till the last bell ringer dropped dead. <laughs> and the march of the horribles at 5 a.m. brought out the population who generally are on the third quarter in their race through Sumberland. The procession made up in quality what it lacked in quantity. And the remarkable reproductions of nature and art were met with the vo by the voice of praise upon every hand. We understand the first and second prizes were awarded to Messrs. Linehan and Reardon in the order in which they were named. Um, the Horribles Parades of this time did have um, cross-dressing um, jokes on the upper classes. There's no indication that this first one in Beverly Farms had those things, but it probably did. I don't know. Soon after they did. So. Was a 5 a.m. start? 5 a.m. start. I thought you'd like that. Yeah. Is that typical? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Frank Valentino used to Don't start. go give in to current crew any ideas. No, I won't. I won't. <laughs> but they, they were, the older ones, they started around here in, 18, in about 1850. And they were often in places like Lowell, where there was a working class. Mm. And they started out um, as a counter parade. The real parade started at 10, so they had their parade early. Okay, so that's it. Wow. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Joan. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. I didn't do too badly. It's only 10 past. Um, does anybody have questions? Where is the bound advocate kept? At the Beverly Historical Society, Histor Cabot House Library. And I, there are, I thought it was the only one, but there are a couple more. I think that the um, Phillips Library has one. Another question in the back? No. Yeah. I just have a, is that John Baker, the same Baker who was the first mayor? Of yes. Beverly? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't say that. John I. Baker went on to become the first mayor of Beverly. And I learned um, he was a candidate for governor from the um, temperance party. He supported women's rights. He was, he gave a year's salary to help fund the building of the P Beverly Public Library. Mm -hmm. um, he was a man who really loved the city. Ed Brown, who those of you who knew him, um, you know, Ed loved the city too, but he never forgave John I. Baker. Um, if you talk about John I. Baker, Ed would just go into a rage. And it was hilarious. He was tricky, he tricked them. You know, he was, you think the Beverly Farms people, rich people paid off the legislators, John I. Baker paid them off too. <laughs> oh, yeah. He was adamant. So we had a lot of fun with that. But it's an interesting story. Um, the one thing I think should be told, the majority of the summer people weren't really behind this. They were neutral. They didn't really care. They, the tax thing was important, but I think the preservation of Beverly Farms as a, an idyllic summer retreat was just as important. And it wasn't all bad. <laughs> But that was before the influx of the 1900 yeah, that's wealthy people. Before, this, is, this is all, pre this is pre-1900. Yeah. This is when it's still really a Boston, a, a, a Boston, enclave. a rich Boston enclave. enclave. Right. Um, that was a whole and that, all, and that changed later. Right. Yeah. That's a whole other story. Yeah, really. right. That's really. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we've done those before. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? No. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. I wanted to say one thing before um, 
we have another speaker. In thanking people, I did not thank the Friends of the Farms Library. And the Friends pay for lectures and make them possible. So um, I'm very grateful to the Friends. And we're grateful to have you. Thank you. But anyway. Yeah, Ken. So what, and it did come in late, so maybe yeah. I missed some of this. But what was the reaction like or the, uh, um, the response from people in other parts of Beverly to this, and, and sort of were there lingering hard feelings that, you know, sort of? Um, I don't know how long hard feelings lasted over this issue with the rest of Beverly, but I know that there were families in Beverly Farms who never wanted anything to do with Beverly. Wow. Um, John Day, who lived on Valley Street, Collect, had a wonderful collection of glass plate negatives of Beverly Farms that had belonged to his aunt. Um, I can't remember her name. And Neil Olson, who was his neighbor, tried to get him to donate those to the Beverly Historical Society. And he wouldn't because it was Beverly. Wow. Now, Beverly Farms doesn't have a historical society. But he's You're in. no. <laughs> I'm not. I, Nancy's basement. No, Nancy does not collect things. If there's one thing I'm not, it's an archivist. Um, anyway, they disappeared. Um, nobody knows what happened to them, and they were a treasure trove. And they're gone. So, Alan. I'm just gonna, Alan. Can I? Do you mind sure. talking to this? Yeah. This is for the video. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? I can't know. Can you can't hear anything? It's, it's just for the video. Oh, for the video. Okay. You know, this thing about the 4th of July, I never heard it before, but every 4th of July, of course, we live across from the fire station, at 5 o'clock in the morning, there's a giant boom huh? someplace oh, in the middle of Beverly Farms and then firecrackers, and there are people running around in the streets around 6 in the morning. So do you think that that tradition has gone on all the way since then? The tradition didn't go on every year, and there were long periods well, when there were no Well, it's there now. Praise. It's really something. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. When I grew up in Hart Street, yeah. and when we were kids, they used to drive down the street with a, on a truck with a big megaphone right. screaming, yeah. wake up, you know, wake up. Yeah. And I don't remember what time it was, but we were still in bed. <laughs> it goes on for yeah. 50 years. Yeah. We, we moved in in 1996 on Hale Street, and I didn't even know, I never even heard of Frank Colantino. But at 5 o'clock in the morning, he knew about us, a Ralph Colantino. You hear that megaphone truck coming by saying, yeah. wake up, Johnson, it's time for the fourth. <laughs> Isn't that wild? And he said other things. Yeah. Yes, he said a few other things yeah. we don't want on tape. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't run over too much. Great. Yeah. Oh, you're perfect. perfect. Good. Yeah, you have 10 more minutes. I know. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much.